<laughs> my wife gave me this pin for Christmas this past year. It has my name on engraved on it. It's a cross pin. Maybe some of you have got cross pins before or similar pins. You know that inside they have a, a replaceable cartridge when the ink runs out. This pin is empty. Um, I'm not worthy to stand up here and speak, but I'm willing. And when the Lord calls me through the years, I have. I'd like to say that in preparation for today's message, I've never used so much ink crossing out and rewriting and crossing out and rewriting as I have for today's. I come before you today, as always, and I say, good morning, my Heritage Bible Church family and friends. Thank you. You're right. They are doing great this morning. Wow. And this morning, that greeting has extra special meaning to me. None of you have the same mother and father that I do. But the definition of family is people who are joined together by blood. And you are my family because we are joined together by the all-powerful, precious blood of Jesus Christ. You are my eternal family. Now what we know of families, families are those groups of people as we see the families here on earth. The groups of people that go through good times and bad times together. We go through fun and happy and vacations. We go through struggles and problems and even arguments and fights. But at the end of the day, we are still family. Today is the first full day of a new chapter, full Sunday, I take this full Sunday of a new chapter in Heritage Bible Church's history. As we now, as you heard earlier, we have a new pastor and a new pastor's wife. Some folks are very excited about that. Some folks are uncertain about that. This isn't my sermon, but I'm going to throw a little note in here that I'm thankful for our pastor and our elders of the past who've given us wisely a form of governance that is two things. One thing, as a church, our governance is founded solidly on the scriptures on in Timothy and Titus of our structure of our church is founded solidly on Jesus Christ and his word and secondly I believe they had the wisdom to understand that we need doctrinal accountability we need checks and balances and I believe our elders and our pastor was wise enough to put those into our founding documents and I'm thankful for that I don't know if that gives any of y'all comfort or not but it does me I'm excited about our new pastor, Randy John, and his wife, Susan John. Um, as I grow older, my memory's not as good, so sometimes I use memory crutches to remember people's names. Have you ever walked up to someone, introduced yourself, and then before you finish the conversation, you forgot their name? So I, I use memory crutches. Um, Randy John. My first thought when I heard that name was, that's one of those names. He doesn't even have a last name. He's just got two first names right? So, okay, what can I relate those two names to so I can help remember them? Um, John, as we know, of course, is the beloved disciple of Jesus, isn't he? And sorry, but the first thing that popped in my mind, Randy was the famous wrestler, macho man, Randy Savage. So <laughs> no offense, brother Randy, if you're listening. Um, I just felt our church could use a little comic relief right now. Maybe some of you would agree. <sighs> some of you, many of you were involved in the process of selecting a new pastor and maybe in small ways, maybe in large ways. I don't know. But I think we can all agree it's been a long road. It's been a hard road. And some in here would say they are exhausted. 
And many of us would agree, many of us would agree that we've said a few things along the way that we wish we hadn't. But we are still family. And there's two things I know for sure. I know for sure Satan, the old devil, has been working overtime trying to divide our family. You know why? I think I know why. He's seen what we've done in the past as a church and he is afraid. He is afraid of the potential that we have for the cause of Christ. But the second thing I'm sure of is our God is still on the throne. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. The foundation of this church, Heritage Bible Church, is and will continue to be solidly built on the rock and the foundation of Jesus Christ and God's Word. Now, believe it or not, that was not my message. That was merely my prelude for today's message. <laughs> today's message is a message of encouragement. How many of you could use a little encouragement right now? Anybody? Amen. Hallelujah. You know what? God's Word is overflowing with encouragement, isn't it? Um, is my verse up there yet? Y'all can go ahead and throw my verse up there now. It is... Oh, is it? Oh, there we go. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. I know we all know 25, but do we know 24 was right before it? And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that as only you can, that you would quiet our hearts and minds and our distractions and that right now our focus would be on your word and that you would deliver to each of us the word that you have prepared for us today as only you can. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Now I see these two verses and I see what's I don't mean this disrespectfully in any way but I see what I've fondly call a truth sandwich. All right, you got the bread on the top and the bottom and you got the meat in the middle. Let's talk about the middle of this truth sandwich first. In the middle of this passage, we are instructed to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And then it says, as is the habit, the manner of some. Did y'all know that Satan, the old devil, doesn't have any new material? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such is this common to man. That quite simply means the old devil just keeps on using the same tricks over and over. And sadly, the truth is, he doesn't need any new tricks. You know why? <laughs> yeah, you know why? Because we keep falling for the same old stuff. Over and over, generation after generation. And this verse describes it. Just look at it. As is the habit of some. 2,000 years ago, Satan was already busy tempting folks to not attend church. And clearly, he was having some success, wasn't he? This temptation is at least 2,000 years old then, isn't it? Now let's take a minute and look at some of the specific reasons sometimes we don't attend church. We don't assemble together in person. Um, see if they're 2,000 years old or more too. Sometimes um, we don't go to church because it is too cold. Hey, I'm a Florida boy. When it gets down below 50, I'm freezing. I know some of you folks from up north are laughing at me right now. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's too rainy. Uh, and, and, and that can be a legitimate reason, especially for our senior citizens who on a very hard rainy day, we don't want them slipping down and hurting themselves, do we? We don't want that. You know, the opposite of those weather conditions can be true as well. Sometimes it is a beautiful day outside like it is today. Oh my goodness, is that perfect out there today? I kind of think to myself, that's exactly the weather heaven's going to be like every day. 
But sometimes we think, oh, it's such a beautiful day outside. Um, let's go do something fun. We haven't been to the beach in a long time. Let's go to the beach. Or let's go fishing. It's a perfect day to be out on the boat, in the, on the lake. The water is calm. In a few months, we have hunting season coming up. Hmm? Ah, where's Henry? <laughs> It's okay, he never hunted on Sunday, I promise. <laughs> oh. And then, here's one that's probably not 2,000 years old. All those are at least 2,000 years old. How about this one? Uh, it is a beautiful day to go play some golf. Hmm? That one's not 2,000 years old, but it's probably a good 100 years old. right? Or how about this one? These next couple of ones, y'all get ready. Pick your feet up, because I'm going to start stepping on some toes. But believe me, I'm stepping on my toes too, brothers and sisters. How about this one? It's been a long, hard week. I am just too tired. Have you been there, brothers and sisters? Every one of us have been, haven't we? Whew. Ouch. Discernment is what it's called in to, to case there. Here's one that's a doozy. Again, stepping on my own toes. I've heard that guest speaker before this coming this Sunday, and I'm not real fond of him. <laughs> A couple of snickering, and you know, I know why you're snickering too. <sighs> you know, as, as I'm just a little side note here, as, as I go through the rest of this message, I thought to myself, because I've been in those very same shoes, oh, I don't want to listen to that guy again. Uh, he's just not my kind of speaker, you know. You know what, maybe it's not, the Lord's not inspired me to come here this Sunday because of the message that is going to be delivered. Maybe it's because he's encouraging me to come here this Sunday because he's orchestrated someone else that's going to be in here. That I either need a message from them or they could use some encouragement from me. Maybe it's not about the speaker at all. Maybe it's about the assembling of ourselves together. Hmm. Here's a couple of really tough ones. Oh, too many hypocrites in the church. Whew, that's an old one, right? Yeah, there's been plenty of sermons on that. I'm going to brush on past that one. That may be a later date. How about this one? I'm going to stop here a little bit, though. You don't have to go to church to get into heaven. And that's true, you don't. I don't see anywhere in Scripture where it says St. Peter's going to be standing at the pearly gates holding an attendance record. Hallelujah. <laughs> Get out your pen and paper, folks. I'm about to give you the complicated mathematical equation of how to get into heaven. Here's the mathematical equation. I think when you have at least one math teacher, maybe a couple in the, in the audience. Mathematical equation to get into heaven is this. Genuine faith in Jesus Christ plus... Nothing else. It's not through church attendance that we get into heaven. It's not through baptism that we get into heaven, though we are told to follow Christ's example. If you remember the thief that hung next to Jesus on the cross, all he said to Jesus was this, Remember Jesus. He called him by name. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that was enough for Jesus. Jesus said, You'll be in paradise with me today. I don't think that thief ever got baptized. I don't know if he ever even graced a threshold of a church, synagogue with his shadow. We don't get into heaven by how fancy our last name is or, or what family we come from, and we sure don't get into heaven by our good works and our good deeds. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 makes that real clear. For by grace we are saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I heard a pastor give a great message on that one time, and I love what he said about this. He said, I am so thankful that we cannot earn our way to heaven. Because if we could, you know there'd be that one guy who would stand in there telling us all the great things he did to get here. And we'd have to be hearing about that for the rest of eternity. <laughs> You're killing me, Smalls. <laughs> but instead, my brothers and sisters, for all of eternity, you and I are going to be bragging on Jesus Christ. 
Hallelujah. So it's not by our works, it's not by our family tree, it's not by baptism, it's not even by church attendance that we get into heaven. Which begs the question, so why go? Now there may be a lot of biblical reasons. Here I'm going to give you my two. And this is the only two I need. I guess maybe I'm just simple like that. The first reason... I believe it's important that we not forsake the assembling together of ourselves is because it's in Scripture. God's Word makes it real clear to not forsake the assembling of yourselves. God's Word said it. That settles it. I'm just simple like that, I guess. The second reason, if you need another reason, here's another reason, though. You remember when Jesus finished the temptation from the devil? And he comes down out of the wilderness, and, and in Luke 4, 16, it says this. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. And as was his custom. Where was Jesus on the Sabbath? He was in church, folks. Following Christ's example is all the reason I need in the first place. I didn't even need it written in Scripture. Just follow Christ's example. But we follow His example. We have it written in Scripture. I don't know why there's a debate about this. We had a family many years ago in our church who debated this verse. And actually, uh, it, was, it was an oddity to me. I didn't understand why there was a, a debate about this. Titus 3.9 says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Now, there's a time and a place for everything, and there's a time and a place to debate and to understand and correct. But we're called to come here for a couple of different things. And clearly, this verse makes it real clear well, one of the primary things we're called to come and do when we assemble together is. So let's back up for a moment. As we look at this passage again, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, and we see on the top of the sandwich and on the bottom of the sandwich. Well, first off, we see the middle of the sandwich makes it very clear. Don't forsake the assembling of yourself. Come together. The top and the bottom of the sandwich... They are certainly many reasons why we attend church, but this passage seems to only focus on one. Before and after, with just one reason. To encourage one another, to stimulate, to stir one another, to love and to good deeds, is why this passage calls us to not forsake the assembling together. Let's think a little deeper for a moment about all the reasons you and I can give for coming to church. And they are all legitimate reasons. Singing to our awesome Lord. He is so worthy and deserving of that. Thank you for all your work, Brother David, in leading us in that. And to your bride as well, who's, I guess, not here today? Okay. <sighs> Praying. We're told to come together where two or more are gathered together and ask anything in His name. We have prayers of thanksgiving. We have prayers of supplication for all that we are in need of. We are reading His Word when we come and gather together. We are learning from His Word and hopefully we're sharing with one another before and after encouragement from His Word. We're testifying of His goodness. We do that every fifth Sunday. I think that's a wonderful thing that we've added in there. And we are called in this verse to encourage one another. Now, I gave you that list because I want you to give a little challenge here. In this new post-COVID world, where nearly all churches live stream, there's probably some folks watching us right now. I think our average is two a week, humbly. <laughs> but we have a lot of potential there then, don't we, folks? Not to mention many great pastors have their own TV show, how many of these things in this list I just listed off can we do if we stay home and watch church on TV? Now, don't get me wrong. I know there's sometimes we are sick, sometimes we are homebound. This is a great second option that our service can be sent to our home on, in times of that occasion. So let's talk about the 
Can we sing if we're sitting behind our TV at home? Yeah, yeah sure we can. Might not be quite the same effect and the impact, but we can. Can we pray when we're sitting beside our, behind our TV set at home? Sure we can. Can we listen to what's going on in the service, the message that's being proclaimed? We can read from God's Word because we got a Bible at our house, hopefully. How about encouraging one another from the privacy of our own home behind our TV screens? It's kind of tricky, isn't it? Thank you. I'm not saying it's totally impossible, but that is the one thing on this list of reasons that we must be present to do well, to assemble together. Now, for most of my life, my focus on this passage has been on the middle part of the sandwich, not forsaking the assembling together of ourselves. I guess maybe because we had that come up as a issue before and, and it just seems so odd to me that it could, it could be set around and debated. But, but just recently I have noticed the sandwich effect sandwiched together before and after is the reason for assembling to encourage one another, to stimulate one another, to love and to good deeds. Folks, I got a news flash for you. This life is hard. Every week when we leave here and we go back to our homes and our neighborhoods and our careers and, and just a, a, everything we go to, this life is hard. This life will beat you down and keep you down if you let it. And I, folks, being a Christian does not exempt us from struggles. Did you know that? Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble trials and temptations and tribulations. Jesus taught us that it rains on the just and the unjust, doesn't it? Boy, we don't understand that sometimes, do we? And he also said, do not worry about tomorrow, for today has enough trouble of its own. As Christians, we are not exempt from struggles. I'm going to read a couple of wor words here of emotions things that we have come through that we may feel after a long week out in the world apart from one another. You ever get discouraged out in that world? You ever get depressed? How about frustrated? Anybody ever been frustrated after a long week out in... Angry. Mm. We all get angry sometimes, don't we? Some of us would admit right now we are exhausted. How about overwhelmed? How about fed up? Have you ever been fed up? Whew. This life is hard. Now here's a cool thing. Our Lord does not want His children, you and I, to turn to the coping methods of this world. Now, I'll go to some extreme ones, and there could be a long list, but he doesn't want to see us to seek our escapes in the bottom of a bottle of alcohol, does he? Or in the plethora of drugs that are in this world. Um, there could even be some simple things that he doesn't want us to um, escape from the struggles of this world. Eating, an overeating disorder, shopping, um, whew. Don't mean to be stepping on toes, but our Lord doesn't want us to seek out the world's methods of coping. Instead, He wants to. He longs to give us genuine victory. And that too, true victory and peace, I see in this passage, I can think of two places that it comes from. Let me show you what I mean. Let me go a little deeper here. His Word, as we come together, and we listen and we share with one another His Word. And then the encouragement we get and are encouraged to give, give and receive to and from one another. Let's talk about His Word first and then we'll talk about encouraging one another. Oh, there's a lot of encouraging verses we can get here. Galatians 6, 9, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Anybody ever been weary? Anybody ever thought, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing, and it's never going to come back to me. All our efforts are in vain. We've all felt that way sometimes, haven't we? 
God's word encourages us to not lose heart. With men, this is impossible. With God, all things are impossible. Romans 8.21, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. All things through Christ who strengthens me and you. God's word is literally overflowing with life-changing, genuine encouragement. Filling our minds with God's Word, not just on Sunday, by the way. Thankfully, we can fill our minds with God's Word every day. And then sharing encouragement from God's Word. But as a Christian, we have hope and encouragement differently than the rest of the world. Let me tell you why. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ, the solid rock, we stand because, brothers and sisters, all other ground is sinking sand. Let me give you another verse how we can encourage one another. And this is the one about you and I, how we can specifically. And I don't have it up here. I don't have it down here because if you got your Bibles, I want you to open to it. It's 2 Corinthians. Flip open to 2 Corinthians. If you don't have this highlighted, I hope you do. This verse is powerful. 2 Corinthians, the very first chapter. Verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions. And then he says why? So that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, I'm sure one of the reasons God comforts us in all our afflictions is because, quite frankly, He loves us. But it says here He's got another reason. He's, he's great like that. He can, he can bring so many positives out of our afflictions. And the other reason is so that we now, having gone through that affliction and gone through our Lord's comfort, we can now in turn comfort others. And it actually says to are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Each and every one of us have been through a dark tunnel or two or more in our lives. Tunnels that, we, that, that were fraught with affliction and struggles. Think about your own life. Tunnels that we turned, when we turned to Jesus, and maybe we didn't turn right away, but finally we got it figured out and we turned to him eventually in our struggles, that in his time and in his way, he brought us out the other side into his glorious light. And now we have the power that he speaks of in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Has the Lord ever rescued you? I bet he has, hasn't he? But you see, my tunnel was probably very different than each of your tunnels. Maybe that's all in God's design, though, isn't it? On any given Sunday, when a brother or sister walks through those doors... Whatever affliction or dark tunnel they are going through, there's a good likelihood that either you or I or another fellow Christian that we know has been through that tunnel and with Jesus' help has come out the other side into the light. Some days it's our day to encourage another. But you know, some days... God inspires us to come here even when maybe we don't feel like it because it's maybe our day to be encouraged by someone else. Maybe I didn't like the guest speaker that day, but maybe that's not why the Lord was calling me to come because he had someone orchestrated to either be encouraged or to encourage me. 
And did you know our encouragement can even help one another resist the temptations of sin? This is a cool verse, not a real popular verse. This definitely doesn't make the list of top 10 most popular verses. Hebrews 3, 13. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today. Isn't that kind of funny to say, as long as it's still called today? I guess if we're in today, today is never called tomorrow. Now, once we get to tomorrow, it's today now. It's not tomorrow. I don't know, it's just one of those. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Our encouraging one another can help avoid the temptations of sin. Let me show you why. The Lord gave me this verse. I pieced these two verses together. Have the Lord ever given you some verses that you piece together and it's like, wow, you know, I never, I never thought about those two together, but now it opens up a whole new understanding. 1 Peter 5, 8, I bet you do know this one. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's a great analogy as I think about it. A roaring lion walking about seeking who he may devour. Any of you guys love to watch those animal shows on TV? We do, yeah. And sometimes they get pretty graphic, don't they? All right. When the pride of lions are, are getting some dinner, they're going after a herd of whatever it is. Who do they seek out? They seek out the easy mark. They seek out the young. They seek out the weak and they seek out the injured. By the way, just a little side note, if you're in here today and you're under 18, you're one of Satan's primary marks. <laughs> Listen to your parents, okay? They want to protect you from that lion. I think of a couple of visions I've seen on TV of the animals. I think of hippos and crocs. Um, there was this crocodile that was trying to get him a baby hippo. And he found himself coming up, getting that baby hippo right in the midst of a big, what do they call it, a pod of hippos? Big pod of hippos. Now, if you know anything about hippos and crocs, hippos actually kill more people every year than crocodiles do. Hippos are bad mamba jambas. All right. Their tusk, their size, their weight. They were tossing this crocodile around like he was nothing. I don't know if he even lived through that experience, but they were saying, uh-uh, that ain't happening in our midst. You ain't taking our baby. Muskox. You know what a muskox is? Um, that's that uh, big, hairy, buffalo-looking thing, but he's super hairy, and they're all way up north in the frozen tundra that stays 70 degrees year-round, near about, I think, 70 degrees below year-round. I almost messed up there. 70 degrees below. By the way, I'm never going to vacation there, so anything I learn about that, so I'm going to be on a video. Um, <laughs> Woo! Their main um, one that comes after them, of course, is the wolves. The wolves come after the musk ox. They come after the young and the weak, and the injured. But there is a really cool tactic that the musk ox has. I bet some of you have even seen it. They form a tight shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder circle, all their heads facing out, and the young and the weak are in the center protected. They're all around the outside, shoulder-to-shoulder, -shoulder, with their big hoofs on their 900-pound bodies, and their hard heads. Whew. Eh, sorry, I'm talking about myself here. And, and their horns. And by the way, did you know this? The female musk ox also has horns. And they're all in a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder circle facing out. And I don't care how many wolves are coming at them. They ain't getting in. Can any of you moms or grandmas out there relate to that? If you're going to come for my baby, you're going to have to come through me. Oh, that we could have that kind of passion for one another. 
You see, when we put these two verses together, they say this. When your fellow brother or sister are going through tough times, when they are discouraged, angry, frustrated, overwhelmed, they are a primary target. They are an easy mark for Satan and his temptation. And we, in this passage, are clearly, no debate needed, called to come alongside and encourage one another day after day after day continually. As I prepared for this message, it inspired me. I know, I don't know some of y'all as well as I should. I know a lot of you real well. Some of you I don't, probably don't know as well as I should. I don't know about y'all, but from now on when I come to church on Sunday, Wednesday, whenever we meet together, I'm going to try to put a high priority on getting to know you better. Because none of you care how much I know until you know how much I care, right? Let's get to know each other better and put a high priority on encouraging one another. Because this life is hard and we need the encouragement from our brothers and sisters on a regular basis. If I may borrow a line from Helen Crow, she has been wonderful all summer as she has encouraged us to look for opportunities. She did it again this morning too, didn't she? Look for opportunities. And I'm going to, if I may tag onto that, let us look for opportunities to encourage one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all the encouragement that we get from your word. Thank you that you are the solid rock we can stand on. And as Christians, we need not live depressed and distraught. This world will get us down, but remind us to come back to you and to your word and to your fellow brothers and sisters that we may encourage one another all the more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.